we can do <laughs> hare krishna so thank you very much for joining us on this gbc spt live conversation on devotee care called vaishnav seva a weekly dialogue conversation with different leaders across iskon to inspire and embed a culture of devotee care within iskon temples and communities on behalf of the global devotee care directorate we are very honored to have with us his holiness devamrit swami maharaj this afternoon with us welcome maharaj for this facebook live conversation and today's conversation is specifically about devotee care for leaders so you know rather than give a formal intro apart from the fact that maharaj is a member of the gbc and definitely he is you know one of the very very prominent authors within iskon having published several books including from the bbt uh you know as part of a introduction come question that maharaj you are a graduate from yale university and yale university is very famous for having produced many leaders so do you think that being a graduate from yale university gave you an advantage in your leadership role within iskon and what would you comment about others who may not be similarly privileged hmm this is a complex question it takes me back to my last month at yale when i expressed to my dean of studies that i didn't see much place for myself in materialistic society he just looked at me without blinking and said you are a yale man you will influence the world now let's try to understand how that institution prepares its leaders looking back now i can see they have their own version of devotee care or student care before getting to that though i want to point out that that was my karma my attending that university and i have to be careful that pride false ego does not taint my endeavors in bhakti because i have many god brothers who didn't have the background i have yet i hold their feet on high they're such exalted souls so i'm duty bound to you is whatever i have in my background in krishna's service prabhupad's formula was whatever you bring to the table when you come to bhakti you utilize that so we all have different paths and the point is how much are we dedicated to pure devotional service because krishna says in bhagavad gita tesham satata yuktanam bhajitam priti purvaka for those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love i give the intelligence so that is my conclusion the best education the best university is in that verse hari krishna hari krishna thank you maharaj that's extremely hope giving and you have brought the spiritual and transcendental context so powerfully forward now in the 70s you were very deeply engaged in uh, printing publishing distributing shila prabhupad's books in various adventurous ways and uh, you have interacted with shila prabhupad and have seen shila prabhupad interacting with his leaders and you were also you know serving under many of those leaders so this is a question which we are asking all the leaders that amongst all the various qualities of shila prabhupad his divine grace shila prabhupad the founder acharya of iskon which are some of those qualities especially with respect to shila prabhupad's care for his leaders which you personally saw or heard or maybe you saw the impact of that in your you know personal lives during those 70s period when shila prabhupad was still around two things come to my mind 
Number one is he rarely chastised his big leaders in public. You had to hear about it through the back door that so-and-so was chastised sternly. Prabhupada understood that to be a leader means you're sacrificing for his service. You're putting yourself on the line. And so when a mistake was made, he often, I would say generally, and Tamal Krishna Maharaj verifies this, he would do it behind closed doors. He would certainly do it, though. Number two, I observed in Prabhupada such gratitude for anyone who tried to help his mission to his spiritual master. He was so grateful and he would express that just like at the BBT when he gave us the impossible instruction to print all those books in two months. Uh, 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 and then upon the completion of such an impossible task, and to this day, I don't understand materially how it was accomplished. When it was completed, he expressed such gratitude. He wrote a letter saying, by this particular endeavor, you will all go back to Godhead. So he was very firm, yet grateful for anyone who assisted his efforts to please his Guru Maharaj. And I would say that gratitude and appreciation is such an important part of devotee care. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much for sharing these, you know, two gems. Because many times when um, as leaders we are disturbed and we are provoked, then uh, sometimes even in public, this kind of a, a chastisement may happen. And I think the point you made about Srila Prabhupada is so powerful. So my next question is that leaders are very busy executing projects, leading teams, doing things. In fact, even the onus and the responsibility of caring for others rests on the leaders. So then when we discuss this topic, care for leaders. So maybe sometimes some leaders may get a little bewildered or even wonder that, well, I am the person caring for everybody. From where will you generate someone who will care for me? Because I don't see that. So in, in your opinion, how do we go about this task of uh, even uh, making a compelling case that leaders also need care? And how do we uh, make this case strong, both for the leaders to understand and for the devotees who are following the leaders to understand that your leader needs care? and for the leader to understand that he needs the care. So, you know, that's my question. In answering that question, should I give some case histories without mentioning names or places? Yes, Mara, sure, please, go ahead. I've served on every habitable continent of the world. That means everywhere except Antarctica. So I've seen my share of talented, and skilled, even brilliant leaders who, as you said, some or other felt that they were above caring for themselves or even above others asking them, please care for yourself. Without telling you names and places, of course, and bear in mind, I've been all over the world, one leader was becoming a bit infamous for not chanting his rounds. This was a common problem back in the early days because devotees, the leaders were so busy. Uh, everything was booming. <laughs> and so it was very easy. Looking back, I can see it was very easy for a leader to just get absorbed in the booming missionary activities of the Krishna Conscious Society and neglect his, and back then it was simply his, 
uh, spiritual development in the name of sacrificing for Mahaprabhu. So there was this one wonderful leader who had done so much for Prabhupada, but he stopped chanting his rounds and everyone in the community knew about it and they were buzzing about it. So here I am, a young devotee compared to his stature. I decided, what's the use in all this buzz? I'm going to go see him privately. So I did that. And I said, everyone is saying, Maharaj, everyone is saying you're not chanting your rounds. So he looked at me and said, you know, I like you. You come and talk to me straightforwardly. I know everyone's talking behind my back. I like you because you're coming to me straight. And he said, to tell you the truth, Prabhupada said I didn't have to chant my rounds. I was, <laughs> that was a knockout punch for me. So <laughs> I went back and told some other senior devotees. They knew I had gone to see this leader. And so they were waiting to hear the results. And I just told these other senior devotees, he agrees. He doesn't chant his rounds. Immediately, they went and stormed into his office. Aha! You have admitted. Devamrita Das Brahmachari uh, has told us you have admitted you're not chanting. He just looked at them calmly and said, I never said that. I don't know why Devamrita has said such a thing. I've never said that. So then they came back storming at me. Oh, you made this all up. I made this all up. Oh. <laughs> another case in another part of the world. And I'm giving these examples not to stir things up, but just to give you firsthand graphic accounts uh, of lessons that we all should learn from, especially me. I said to a leader who I knew since his we knew each other since our beginning days, at least my beginning days. He was a few years earlier than me. And I, I said, all right, all right. This is back in the Zonal Acharya days. I said, you're not happy. You're not like the way you used to be when you would just travel everywhere, preach, inspire devotees, encourage your leaders to develop. You're not like that anymore. What happened? You should go back to the way that you started. You were so happy then. Now I can see that things have changed. He turned red and that was it. And that was the end of me. <laughs> Some years later, that wonderful devotee mm, fell apart completely. And before he fell apart, although I hadn't spoken to him for years, he sent me a message, an, an a re audio soundtrack of his chanting Hare Krishna while crying. And I didn't know what to make of it. I was so afraid. Uh, I got decapitated years ago. I don't know what to make of this. Later, I found out a few days after he sent that message, he mm, went into unknown behavior. And so, yes, I've seen leaders living in denial about the need for be for being cared for. What do you think about that? Yes, Maharaj. I think, uh, you know, some of your examples and case studies which you have shared is very revealing and very important uh, for us to note. And, you know, we were reading one of your books on uh, the mellows of devotional service, which they arise when we practice the devotional service nicely. So this question is related to that. All of our acharyas and the scriptures, they warn us so much about offenses. And one of the meanings 
or definitions of offenses or upper radha is radha refers to satisfaction and upper radha refers to diminishing satisfaction and is it that in leadership roles one is expected to take decisions and one does take decisions and when those decisions affect people in different ways and then you know when people are unhappy and uh, they are not really you know very sure about why this has happened to me and things like that so is there some kind of an impact which affects the leader and is that one of the reasons why you know it is more and more challenging for devotees who are practicing sadhana bhakti to experience genuine satisfaction and joy even in leadership roles because of the subtle influence of the offenses which affects them and in some way and if that is the case then what's the solution because you know the society needs leaders and the society of devotees is very much looking up to leaders to lead them so what would be that mantra or the formula to lead make decisions and be engaged in a very dynamic way in leading the krishna consciousness movement at the same time to not tread on the very dangerous mind field of aparad or offenses one main problem is pride because often a leader has facility to do things to execute and that can fill you with a sense of achievement uh and it creeps in very subtly so therefore anyone in a leadership capacity especially has to always be begging krishna please don't let pride gobble me up it, it's something about acting as a leader whether it's managemental or in a spiritual capacity uh, in terms of just advising devotees rather than dealing with organization. Of course, we know organizing Mahaprabhu's mission is also spiritual. But there's something about being in that in the driver's seat <laughs> that mm, can go to your head. And this is what happened to so many of the great devotees that were in the early days of ISKCON. They've done a service for us because we can learn by their mistakes. And therefore, I feel that somehow or other, Krishna will be merciful upon them, even though they may not be practicing bhakti anymore in this lifetime. But they <laughs> were the first ones to carry the burden. And we can learn by their example everything not to do. Otherwise, we would have no historical precedents or no, as you call them, case studies whatsoever. The case studies would be us. Right. Thank you so much, Maharaj. What do you feel are five main areas of caution which uh, a leader, you know, within ISKCON should uh, be careful about? How? How would you categorize, you know, four or five main areas of caution for leaders? First of all, I mentioned pride. Uh, it's amazing how sneaky the entrance of pride can be. So we've talked about that. But I can elaborate a bit more about the early days when Prabhupada was present with us. The natural tendency not natural, but natural material tendency was for someone to think because I'm associating with Prabhupada, uh, I'm getting direct instruction from him. Uh, therefore, I'm in the winner's circle. I'm in, I'm in rarefied atmosphere. Uh, some other, I must be something special. Even though Prabhupada himself I remember once he said in a lecture, if you think 
that someone is advanced just because they're in close physical proximity to me, then I say the mosquito is the most advanced devotee because the mosquito is so close to me. But what is the business of the mosquito to bite me? So there is that pride. Of course, Srila Prabhupada is not physically present, but we have leaders of various levels. And when leaders get together, it's possible that a leader can take that in the wrong way. That just see, I'm I'm with the in crowd, I'm with the with the power boys, the proactive boys, <laughs> and these days, girls, <laughs> men and women. And so, wow, I've made it. <laughs> I've made it to the parliament. <laughs> I've made it to the board. So we always have to beg Mahaprabhu for his mercy. Please let me understand that I am just a tiny servitor. And one really has to, at least I, I have to beg for that uh, constantly <laughs> without cessation. And it does become ecstatic after a while when you realize your constitutional position as being just a tiny blade of grass at best. <laughs> Number two, you asked for the five areas of caution. Number two, isolation. I can talk for a long time about this. Uh, it's happened so often in the past, and I still see it happening today. Leaders become isolated by virtue of their service, their stature, and their geographic location. They mm, seal themselves off in their own realm for the necessity of service and focusing on the service. Uh, let's consider like Prabhupada disciples, there are not that many these days. And so if you're in a part of the world, okay, where I am right now, I'm speaking from New Zealand. How many Prabhupada disciples are there now in this country? Mm, three. <laughs> if I go to Australia, which I can't now because of COVID-19, uh, if I go to Australia, I'll, I'll find maybe five or six more that are active. So that means, besides the association of the wonderful grand disciples of Prabhupada, who let us not in any way minimize them, they are the present and the future. <laughs> but if I want association with, with my God brothers, I've got to go out of my way. <laughs> I can't just become busy, busy, busy in my own lair, in my own cave and, and say, hey, what do you want out of me? There's no one around. So <laughs> that's the way it is. No, I've got to seek out association. That is my duty to the devotees I'm serving. That is my duty to the Krishna Conscious Society. I've got to be proactive about seeking association and avoiding being isolated. Because once you get isolated, you start thinking that everything you think is so divine and important. <laughs> Therefore, one has to go out of the way to associate with devotees. I could talk longer about isolation, but I want to get to number three, which is envy. It's amazing about that monster envy. Uh, I remember Prabhupada explaining that envy means indirect appreciation because you only envy someone who's better <laughs> or has something better. You don't envy someone who's worse off. So if that person is actually better and doing better, why be envious? Just directly appreciate, oh, you have done so nicely. You have done so wonderfully. No doubt it's an austerity for that person to hear that, for that devotee to hear such things. But 
it's very purifying for yourself to say that. And somehow or other, Krishna in everyone's heart, I see, balances the whole situation out. The devotee is being appreciated and praised, doesn't relish that, but because it's the Krishna conscious thing to do, somehow or other, the dynamics balance. So converting envy to appreciation, direct expression of appreciation is so important. And you can never make a mistake that way. You can never appreciate too much. Even to your subordinates or younger devotees, appreciate, show gratitude. Uh, notice how their future will be better than yours. I remember Prabhupada saying about how he viewed his disciples. He said, I look at them all as little spiritual masters that my guru has sent to me for me to train up. <laughs> Number four, inattentiveness to the necessary spiritual nourishment due to busy, busy, busy in Krishna's service. It's amazing how this creeps in because if you're practicing a bit of karma yoga and not full bhakti, you're attached to what you're doing and offering it to Krishna. Whereas full, full bloom bhakti means whatever Krishna wants, however Krishna wants it. Most of us should not look down at karma yoga. We should look up to it. Yes, I want to offer my skills to Krishna. I'm attached to acting in this way. Let Krishna have all the fruits. But there's a problem if we just become attached to doing our thing for Krishna. <laughs> so much so that we forget about the spiritual nourishment necessary to carry on. Number five. Ah, an interesting one. I wrote these things down just to make sure I remember them. <laughs> Not taking sufficient shelter of the Dom. I have seen this with my fellows, my older God brothers. Uh, I've seen this. They stop going to Brindavan. They stop going to Mayapur because they're busy, 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 or they don't like India. And I know from my own experience and the experience of my associates that <clears throat> Prabhupada gave us these temples and the Dhams knowing that preaching is austere, very demanding. Managing is very austere and demanding sometimes. And we need to recharge. So I've talked to leaders who neglected sufficient time in the Dom. And they told me afterwards, after that some problems came in, I guess I didn't spend enough time in the Dom. I've heard that several times. So that's five. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for really, you know, going deep into this uh, aspect and then coming out with five areas of caution and especially you know one would not think about something like spending time in the dham because typically when one gets busy in the practice of krishna consciousness and one is taking responsibility and one is not uh, stationed close to any of the dhams then one may think that okay when i whenever i get an opportunity whenever i get a time i'll go there whenever it is suitable but to really prioritize that and then spend quality time to rejuvenate one's practice of Krishna consciousness. And along with that, you know, the spiritual attentiveness, which is so important and appreciation. And, uh, you know, some of these topics need to be really discussed, really churned and presented to various leaders, even before they take up leadership responsibilities to be more on the proactive side. So that kind of brings me to my next question that what are the five top ways you feel that one can actually demonstrate and share care with 
devotees with the leaders how do we show this care to leaders in a practical way which mm. they'll actually you know appreciate first of all i would say empathy uh, try to understand how the leader is carrying burdens sympathize with that everyone loves sympathy uh, i can understand that you're dealing with things events and duties and situations coming at you at every moment i can understand that uh, therefore i'll be a bit patient the so first is empathy number two is patience i'll be a bit patient in my presenting to you a problem that i'm having or a problem i see in others or an organizational problem i'll be patient number three respectful disagreement I can understand why you would think like that and want to do like that, but let me offer another opinion. Let me give some feedback respectfully. Mm. In the example I gave of the leader who wasn't chanting his rounds and admitted it to me, as you remember, he told me, I appreciate you. I like you because you come and tell me straight. Whereas these others, they're just behind my back. I know what's going on. So respectful disagreement. Number four, something Srila Prabhupada wrote in a letter, which always caught my interest. <laughs> it was kind of reverse thinking. He said, good leadership depends on good followers. If they're not good followers, how could you be a good leader? <laughs> I said, wow, I would have never thought of that. <laughs> He was telling these devotees who were writing him, you're talking about this leader, but what about the followers? <laughs> How can the leader truly lead if the followers are, <laughs> are not competent? So we can help leaders by being uh, good uh, servitors, by being good followers. Being a good follower doesn't mean be a mindless robot. It just means understanding how organizations work and how someone has to make decisions and someone has to follow them. When ISKCON started offering management courses years ago in the first days or the first years of it, I sent quite a few devotees to that course who, and I told this to Anutama Prabhu who was starting to give those courses at that time. I said, I've sent devotees who are not going to be presidents or in charge of this or that, but I've sent them to understand what management is like. And when they came back from the course, all these devotees told me the same thing. I'm not criticizing anymore. I'm dropping all my campaigns. Now I can understand what a leader has to go through. <laughs> so I told Anutabrabu, well done, well done. <laughs> Problems in several temples were solved just by my sending these non-managers to a management course. <laughs> what else? Hmm. Allowing the leader to have some space periodically. The leader needs some downtime where he can recharge spiritually. If he has a family, he needs to uh, get in touch with his family more. If he's a, a renunciate, he needs to seek out some associates to hear and chant with. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, there's one leader I know. He's been in his post for ooh, more than 30 years. And he's known for being a wonderful devotee, of course, and a wonderful organizer, manager. Rock steady. And he has a policy that he's on call at his large temple one of the mega temples in Iskand, I won't tell you where. Uh, he's on call from Mongol Arti to 3.30. Five, 
five days a week. And then outside of those weekday times, you can't get him. <laughs> He's at his home, hearing and chanting, taking care of affairs, but in solitude. On his email, he's on the phone. But if you bang on his door in his apartment, I, <laughs> there's going to be no answer. So he told me how he's got devotees trained up. It took a while, but he's been doing this for 30 years. And now everyone understands this is his downtime. And whatever I think is an emergency practically never is a pressing emergency. It can wait till tomorrow morning. I'll see him at Mongol RT every morning. He's there without fail. But just when 3.30 p.m. comes around, that's it. And then Saturday, everyone knows he'll go to the full morning program on Saturday. And then the rest of the day he spends with his wife, uh, who is a very extraordinary, powerful servitor. And so uh, you don't bother him Saturday after breakfast, all day Saturday. And then Sunday, he's right there at the morning program again, full morning program and the Sunday feast. So he keeps that rock steady schedule decade after decade. And everyone's accustomed to it. They all accept it. We fit into that framework with our mm, trying to contact him. <laughs> and I see it works. He told me at first they didn't accept it years ago. Oh, I've got this emergency. I know it's 5.30 in the evening and you don't deal with business and management at that time, but this has to be, I have to talk now. They got over that. And so he established a rhythm <laughs> and the whole community accepts that rhythm because they know when he's on call, he is on call. He's on top of everything. And when he clicks off, he clicks off. And Devotees can see he's been going on and on with this service for so long. What is his secret? <laughs> I thought that was an interesting example to relay for con conveying the point about allowing the leader some space. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for you know sharing the five top ways in which one can show care, to show empathy, to show patience to have respectful disagreement and uh, to have responsibility as a follower also that the way we follow will have its impact on the leader. That's mm -hmm. also a kind of devotee care for the leader. And mm -hmm. most importantly, allowing some space and some downtime for the leader. I think these are really amazing gems and uh, many of the leaders across the world of ISKCON are going to benefit and uh, not just now, but also in future from some of these nuggets you just shared with us. So this brings me to another point that ISKCON has just begun its formal leadership training at certain levels. Now in your travels, in your experiences, in your you know, interactions with other spiritual organizations across the world, what have been some of the most impressive leadership uh, training and care for leaders standards of care or systems of care, especially for leaders, which you have seen in different organizations, uh, apart from ISKCON, you know, beyond ISKCON in your uh, experience, which you feel, which we can try to follow or imbibe some salient points. Let me go back to something I said at the very beginning. Looking hindsight about my university life, and understanding something about devotee care, I can certainly understand more. I can see what Yale University and these top Ivy League schools do. Their policy is once we admit you, and practically most students kill themselves trying to be admitted, uh, once we admit you, we lavish you because we see your potential. We see that you are a future leader. That's why we admitted you. We want leaders. We want to influence the world. Like my dean told me, 
You are a Yale man. You will influence the world. We know what you, we are doing. That's basically what he was telling me. Do you think we're fools? Do you think we've given you all this scholarship money <laughs> just for you to renounce the material world? We, you're not, he was confident, you're not going to do that. We, we, we've done our job. We have cared for you. And they did. Once you're admitted, it's like you've entered Brahma Loka. And they do a huge job on your ego, by the way. But they also give you any kind of care you need. What do you want? Medical care? We've got the best hospital. You want psychological care? We've got the best psychology department to help you. Uh, you need more money? What is money? We've got loads of it. We've got a, you know, billions upon billions of dollars in endowment fund. <laughs> You need more scholarship money? You need more living expenses? Take it, take it. But they always remind you, remember Mother Yale. In other words, when you graduate and make your millions and billions or become president, senator, or whatever, CEO, remember who cared for you, who gave you everything, remember Mother Yale. So they lavished their students and give you no excuse for not taking advantage of the care. It is material care, but I learned this is how you groom future leaders. You're recognizing their potential and giving them all facility. They knew what they were doing. <laughs> they understood that 99% of our students, when they graduate, they're going to be the top leaders. This is how we shape the world. So we're going to give them everything. These students will have no excuse not to succeed. Now, of course, it's material life, and I have to give you some statistics just to balance things out, because it's not devotee care. It is mm, fruit of worker care. But still, we can learn something. 45% uh, of their student body, they've released the statistics, 45% seek out mental counseling at least once during their four years there because the students tortured themselves so much in high school and secondary school to get become admitted. And by the time they achieve Brahmaloka, many of them are in bad shape. And therefore, psychological care is necessary. So my point, though, is I just wanted to balance out the <laughs> so-called material glories, don't mind. So my point is that I can see how they invested in their students. They counseled them at every step. I had academic advisors when in my first year. Uh, they know what they're doing. <laughs> and they only ask, remember, after you're successful, and we know you're going to succeed, after the success and the money comes, remember Mother Yale and contribute, donate to our fund. <laughs> so yes, that is what I remember the most about other organizations. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj, for sharing those realizations. And, uh, you know, definitely the one takeaway point from that example which you just shared is that we have to recognize the potential. And coming back to Chaitanya Charitamrita, so can you share, you know, because you're a amazing scholar of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leelas and you present it in so many wonderful ways and analyze some of the lessons so beautifully that would you like to share some uh, incident which you remember of how Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or his associates really showed that kind of a care for uh, seeing the potential of someone and you know ultimately groom them and how the world benefited from that. I was just meditating on this verse from Chaitanya Shari Tamrita today. Uh, it's chapter 10 of the Anchalila text one. Funny that you asked me 
to say something from Chaitanya Charitamrita. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, this is the verse I've been meditating on today. I don't know if it hits spot on with your specific request, but in any case, it is nectarian. Vande Sri Krishna Chaitanyam Bhakta Nugaha Kataram Yena Kenapi Santristam Bhakta Dat Tena Shraddhaya. Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is always pleased to accept anything given with faith and love by his devotees and is always ready to bestow mercy upon them. That is my focus for today. Always ready to bestow mercy upon them and pleased to accept anything given with faith and love. And that kind of love is not cheap, but Mahaprabhu makes it easy for us to develop that love for Krishna, which would otherwise be impossible. Mm. The second thing that comes to my mind is the Panchatattva. The more the Panchatattva dance, the more they make it easier for us to engage in Krishna's service and taste love of Krishna. And the supply is inexhaustible. Mm. The more they drink of devotional service, the more the supply increases. So this is my conclusion, that for leaders, we need to understand, our future leaders, our present leaders, that devotional service is a, a flood. The flood of love of God means the flood of devotional service. So that flood is always going to go on eternally. We shouldn't complain when we're overloaded with service. That means Krishna's favor. We shouldn't complain when, oh, this is too much, this burden, that burden. We simply have to learn how to swim in that flood, not complain about it. I try to think. It's only because of my ineptitude that I'm feeling stresses and strains and oh what to do now if i were only more krishna conscious i'd be able to handle all this so rather than complaining oh what are the devotees doing now this devotee's doing this that one's misunderstanding that i beg mahaprabhu teach me how to swim in the flood of devotional service which is the flood of love of krishna that's the benediction I pray for. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for that amazing answer. Definitely, we need to learn to swim, you know, all strokes, you know, whatever way we can, because definitely the deluge and the flood sometimes can be overwhelming. So, Srila Prabhupada was instructed by Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarav Thakur to establish Krishna consciousness in the West, and he established in 1966 and till around you know the 80s krishna consciousness was very much flourishing across the world especially in the west but then over a period of time we have seen that uh, you know especially leaders in the west seem to have more problems maintaining the krishna conscious enthusiasm and uh, leadership roles and historically it looks like you know, outside of India, there were more leadership crises than in India, per se. So would it be accurate to say that, you know, maybe one uh, needs to support the leaders taking leadership roles in the West more and uh, be very conscious about it and give and make special strategies to give that protection and care. And, you know, just we would like to hear your thoughts on how we have seen some of those crises manifest through the you know early 80s and mid 80s and going on into the 90s and how it has impacted the growth of ISKCON, especially in the West. And a lot of it had to do with uh, you know crises with the leadership. So, what would be your take on that? Since you currently have become 
quite well known for reintroducing Krishna consciousness in the amongst the Western uh, you know population and leading the outreach with strategies. Well, first of all, our beloved India is changing rapidly. <laughs> Secondly, yes, still in terms of a sinful atmosphere, the West reigns supreme <laughs> without a question, although India is changing so rapidly. Mm. Yes, outreach outside of India can be very demanding because you have no semblance of or remnants of a sane, stable culture to depend on. Again, India is changing rapidly, but there's still traces. There's still uh, mm, leftover stability, cultural stability, although that's eroding. St it's still there, though, whereas the Wild West gets wilder every year. So therefore, it's very incumbent. It's very necessary for our outreachers and leaders in the Western world to take shelter of the Dom. That's what I do. And Krishna has blessed me with wonderful associates. And we hear and chant together in the Dom regularly. That's why this COVID-19 situation is mm, a bit mm, a challenge for me and my associates because we won't be able to meet together in the Dom. It seems we don't know when that's going to happen. We're so accustomed to recharging in that way. So yes, we're back to that point, number five, in terms of <clears throat> five areas of caution for leaders. Number five was not taking shelter sufficiently of the Dom. Prabhupada himself said that he made these temples in Mayapur and Vrindavan specifically for his Western outreaches to come and wash off. He said that preaching in the West can be contaminating. Uh, the atmosphere is polluted. Some residues come upon you, uh, even without your warning that. And so therefore, Srila Prabhupada said the Dhams, his temples and the Dhams are there so that his Western outreachers can go and wash off that contamination that's externally clinging to them and rejuvenate themselves. So yes, that realization has to be there. We're back to the Dom again. <laughs> yes, it's a very important factor. And Srila Prabhupada himself recognized uh, the dangers in the Western world. And he gave, he tr gave us the best solution. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for sharing that realization. That's extremely important. So, you know, as we are uh, spending time in ISKCON and ISKCON is spreading all across the world. And uh, you have seen the growth of ISKCON over the last 55 years. So if we were to ask you that, what would be the three top changes which would be required either in the culture or in the leadership or in the systems within ISKCON, which would facilitate better care for leaders. So what would those three top changes be in the current paradigm as per you know, your opinion, Maharaj? Every leader should demonstrate how he or she is arranging for peer support. Uh, no excuses that, oh, I'm in Argentina, what can I do? Uh, of course, with the COVID, that's really restricted our travel. But otherwise, in normal times, every leader should be able to demonstrate his or her ability to associate with other, other pe uh, with peers. And let me add one point because I hear this a lot and you've reminded me, thank you. Associating 
with devotees is not a material social skill. I often have to point this out because sometimes I hear from devotees in leadership capacities that, well, I'm just not a sociable person. I'm, I'm quiet or I'm just withdrawn. That's just the way I am. But I try to point out to myself and anyone who will listen <laughs> that associating with devotees is a divine empowerment that you have to beg for. Krishna, please give me the ability to associate with devotees. It's also what I call a Vaishnava sport. Look at that devotee. He's a wonderful devotee. How can I get his association? What can I do? So you're always like a, a sports star, athlete. You're always calculating. Do I make this move? Do I make that move? Of course, you don't tell the devotee, but you're watching for opportunities. <laughs> what can I do to deepen my relationship with this devotee? And this is a wonderful way to live life. That's why I call it the Vaishnava sport. And you're praying, you're begging Krishna. I don't know how I'm going to pull this one off, how I'm going to be able to taste this devotee's association. Krishna, please help me. <laughs> I'll be patient. So you're always in that kind of mm, mentality that this, this sangha with devotees is a divine empowerment. It doesn't depend on my material personality. It doesn't depend on whether I'm, I've got the gift of the gab. <laughs> you know, sometimes people think Americans just can just spontaneously talk about anything, crack a joke within half a second, or just always got something to say. And yeah, to the extent, to some extent, the culture is like that. Of course, I've been all over the world, so I can't say I'm much of an American. But anyway, <laughs> You would think that, wow, I can't talk like that. I can't just bubble spontaneously, come up with a joke every five seconds. And uh, it's not about that. It's a spiritual empowerment, a shakti that you beg Krishna for. And Krishna gradually bestows it upon you. And you taste the reservoir of um, devotee sangha. And you become addicted to it. So that is an important point for me. It's not a mundane social skill. And I hope anyone in a leadership position now and in the future recognizes that. We have to learn how to associate with our peers. Uh, whether you think they're a little bit more advanced than you or much more advanced than you or a little bit less advanced or much less advanced, We've got to learn how to associate with them. And it's such a learning experience. It's uh, sometimes it's tough on your false ego. I'll be the first to say, <laughs> but it is so purifying, so enlivening. I thank Krishna that somehow or other I have attained a bit of association from such wonderful devotees. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for sharing your amazing insights on this. And I can see one thing which you're really emphasizing for leaders is the peer association in a very spiritual, transcendental context of practice of the Panchanga Bhakti, the simple, direct process of hearing, chanting, relishing the practice of Bhakti in a holy dham and a context where a spiritual environment can be created. And I think the repeated emphasis which you're making is really being noticed. And thank you very much for sharing with your experience from the past. So we are very grateful to His Holiness Devamrit Swami Maharaj on behalf of all of the audience today uh, who are present live and then who will also be hearing the recordings later. We are very grateful Maharaj for sharing your decades long journey, your experience and unpacking all of those complexities in the form of such simple, wonderful, you know, nuggets of wisdom, clearly delineated points like, you know, just to remind everybody again, the five main areas of caution, which Maharaj explained for leaders is first of all, 
one has to be very spiritually nourished and one should be very cautious about losing the spiritual nourishment second he mentioned about inattentiveness during the practice of the process third he mentioned about not sufficient not sufficiently spending time in the holy dham and getting nourished in the holy dham then he spoke about how one as a leader may have tendency to be isolated just because of being extremely busy and absorbed in fulfilling his responsibilities and fifth caution he has given us is being very cautious about envy creeping into the heart and how we should convert that envy into direct appreciation and i would like to conclude today's session by also reflecting on the five top ways maharaj has shared on how one can share care for a leader within iskon and the first being that we actually try to become good followers and secondly he spoke about expressing disagreements in a respectful way so that the point can be expressed but at the same time the relationship can be maintained third he spoke the beautiful example of a leader how he created downtime for himself by communicating very clearly that he needs his own space and gradually that communication went across and uh, we can see that it worked for that person and he has managed to maintain a very strong robust consistent leadership profile for several decades in the service of shila prabhupad mm -hmm. so having downtime and allowing space for the leader and then showing patience and fifth is showing some empathy so thank you so much maharaj on behalf of the global devotee care uh, directorate and also on behalf of the gbc spt strategic planning team we would like to express our gratitude to you and to all those who are watching this uh, program live the details about the next such conversation which may happen sometime the next week the exact details of the speaker and the timings and the dates would be communicated on the same facebook uh, page so please stay tuned in to continue conversations on devotee care to create inspiration amongst leaders and uh, influencers amongst iskon on how important it is to establish the various levels of devotee care within iskon communities within iskon temples so with those words thank you all very much hare krishna thank you garanga prabhu hare thank krishna thank you maharaj hare krishna